So uh, I just wanted to say that I did look up about Maine and its lieutenant governor from, I was quite surprised, as I said, I missed, I missed Maine history uh, because I went to Catholic boarding school in Waterville. And uh, so I never did know anything about it, but the fact that you don't have a lieutenant governor and it's the president of the Senate uh, who serves until the next election, or if it's uh, the vacancy happens really close to the next election, then it's actually for the whole ex unexpired term. So you could easily get a lieutenant governor, a, a new governor who's not the same party as the old governor, uh, and who in fact was only elected by a Senate district in Maine, which I think is a really interesting thing. And that has been in place since, wait for it, 1820. So uh, nobody's mm. seen any reason to change it at this point, I guess. Um, in terms of current events, I, I have thought two, several things just really were um, striking me. And one is, I, I don't know whether I've mentioned Heather Cox Richardson's blog to you all. Yeah, yeah. or you know about it. It's a terrific, um, I think she's amazing. And maybe I did mention it last week, but maybe others of you know, I know that some of you are, are subscribers, but anyway, she's a history teacher at, uh, a professor at, at Boston College. And, uh, and she is, um, and she lives in Maine, actually, um, on the coast. And uh, I really, I really appreciate her insights. And she just wrote something today in which she's talking about voting and sort of democracy and representation, those of you who are reading it, but she apparently not, there, there was the guy who, who was quoted last week or maybe two weeks ago in, um, I, I think he is from Arizona, John Kavanaugh. Uh, I think he's the, he's the, in the House of Representatives in, in Arizona. He said about voting that quantity is important, but we need to look at the quality of votes too. And, uh, but that was bad enough, egregious. But here's this guy he, in the National Review, a uh, commentator named Kevin Williamson has justifying voter suppression by suggesting, quote, the Republic would be better served by having few but better voters. Representatives are, quote, are people who act in other people's interest, which is different from doing what voters want, quote. So this, this isn't even a little bit disguised uh, under some kind of, you know, anodyne, uh, whatever you might want to say. Th this is flat out saying, Totally, this should be an elite situation here in which each, each vote should not be equal. It's not, of course, equal in electoral college and it's not equal uh, in the Senate. And now it, maybe it shouldn't be equal anywhere according to them. And she points out, this is the same argument that James Henry Hammond, if you don't know James Henry Hammond from South Carolina, uh, Civil War, uh, pre-Civil War Senator from South Carolina, he is a piece of work and I won't spend a lot of time on him. Uh, in the United States Senate in 1858, he defended the idea that Congress should recognize the spread of human enslavement into Kansas, despite the fact that the people living in that territory wanted to abolish slavery. Our constitution, Hammond said, did not dictate that people should be annoyed with the cares of government, but rather directed they should elect leaders who would take those cares upon themselves. And so that we should just be grateful, I guess, for all of that. Leading Americans argued that such men as black men, immigrants, poor workers, they corrupted the vote by electing lawmakers who provided public infrastructure like schools and hospitals, paid for with the tax dollars of hardworking white men. To keep poor voters and men of color from the ballot, new state laws call for literacy tests, right? Poll taxes and the grandfather clause in which it literally said, I don't think I ever knew this, that a man could vote if his grandfather had. And that's what the original grandfather clause was. So that theory of government um, was also articulated by Hammond in 1858. He explained that the South had figured out the best government in the world. It had put a few wealthy, educated, well-connected men in power over everyone else. He called these other people mud sills, which is a, a term apparently from construction where you put that on the, in literally the mud and you build your house on it. And he said, these people are mud sills. They're workers that produce the capital supporting society, but they have little direction or ambition and have to be controlled by their superiors. In the South, he explained to his Northern colleagues, the mud sills were black, but in the North, they were wage workers. And it was imperative that such men be kept from political power for quote, now here's the key. If they knew the tremendous secret that the ballot box is stronger than an army with banners and could combine, <laughs> where, where would you be? Where would you be? Your society would be reconstructed, your government overthrown, your property divided by the quiet process of the ballot box. And so here from a man who absolutely didn't believe in any of the fundamental values, pointing out how important the ballot box, uh, ballot box actually was. So I found that really, really relevant. So maybe some of you took uh, the advantage of the, of the pro and con videos that were sent. 
Do you have a question, Leslie? Uh, you know, actually, this view of elitism in our government really goes back to the founders. I mean, even, even Hamilton, you know, sort of alludes to that without being quite as clear as the one you just read, but yeah. alludes to the fact that there are some voters who are better or some citizens who are smarter and sh should have the responsibility. I mean, that's embedded into our system. You're, you're right. And certainly, as we said before, just to recap, they did not ever expect it to be a, a democracy and a pure democracy, one person, one vote. That's not what they had in mind. And they were doing a, a constitutional republic, a representative government. Uh, they didn't want a monarch, as we put, pointed out, but they also didn't want mob rule. But I think what's happened, though, is the Constitution has evolved. By the time we get to 1858, you know, the suffrage has been uh, in, increased, and we have a situation in many of the states, they've eliminated property requirements, you know, extended the vote. And it's just a continued thing. But yes, those people originally, Hamilton in particular, was not necessarily a fan of the ordinary hoi polloi, uh, the great unwashed, we might call them, those people. The Electoral College never functioned as it was intended. Uh, it was meant to be deliberative and independent. Um, if you've read your Federalist 68, as I'm sure you have now, uh, the, um, it was a compromise with um, you know, James Wilson and Madison put in place this indirect election as opposed to the popular vote that they actually wanted. Um, and then people became, they thought that they would be elected by the legislatures. It became a popular vote uh, in the states as they decided. And then people were pledged, started being pledged to a candidate right off the bat. They were not independent people sitting in a room and making a judgment. And then soon they got pledged to a party and you ended up with slates of electors and all of that happened very soon. And it was not at all what they intended. And in particular, the biggest, the biggest monkey wrench was the winner take all, which is decided by the states. And it was happening very quickly by 1800, there were states doing that. And so other states are like, well, we have to do that. The plan they thought they were going to have, Madison, in particular was by congressional district, the way Maine does it and Nebraska does it now was the way they anticipated, but they didn't write that down and it's not in the description and it isn't what happened because the parties ended up finding, aha, we get a lot more clout if it's winner take all, we get our whole bunch and we give them to somebody, then they're gonna pay attention to us and that's still the situation today. So that has totally warped the situation in terms of the percentage of votes counting. And then the final, the final thing is that, um, that the system is completely controlled by the states. It is not a federal system, it's state by state and the state legislatures are constitutionally given the entire authority to determine that mark. When did uh, Maine and Nebraska go to the more you know, reasonable system and how did it come about in those two states? They did it in 18, uh, 18, in 1971 or two was Nebraska, I think, or was it Maine first? Maybe it was Maine in 1972 and then um, Alaska, Alaska, Nebraska was in 90 something. Uh, I don't know how it came about, but it was by the legislatures, clearly. But the thing is, it, it was after some election. Obviously, there was some statewide issue about it, but it was not an issue. Maine never split its vote, even though it could have, until 2016. That's the first time Maine split its vote. Uh, and I'm not sure about Nebraska, I think, did it one time before that. So that's when people became aware of it. And then, and then finally, uh, the other piece of this is the unrepresented nature, unrepresentative nature of the Electoral College, because it's based on the Senate which is two per state, and those are added into the thing, means that there is a huge disproportionate weight of each vote. It is a complete violation of one person, one vote in that a vote in Wyoming, which is the least populated state, right? Weighs one individual vote there, 3.6 times more than a Californian's vote. Three, three times plus, three and a half times more. And it's actually, that's varied. It, it depends also on turnout. In states where the turnout is lower, your vote counts more. So you have to factor that in if you're going to do an actual algorithm. And that's all, all I know about math is the word algorithm. I don't actually know what that even means. But it sounded very, I hope, uh, professional to you when I said that. So if you average, it says, the 10 most populous states and compare the power of their residents' votes to those of the 10 least populous states, it's, a, it's about 1 to 2.5. So the 10 least popular states have two and a half times more influence, an individual vote in one of those states, than the influence that a vote has in the state in the 10 most populous states. So clearly it's not representative, nor was it intended to be, uh, but the winner take all has really distorted all of that. All right, you can see this, some of you, yes. All right, so I think we took, I looked at this before we, we, we broke, but these are the complicated elections in history. And I wanna talk a little bit about history uh, 
and then then after our little break, I'm going to talk about um, the Electoral College more specifically about what it is now and how we can change it if we want to change it. So uh, there were three elections that were decided in the House of Representatives, right, uh, as is provided for in the Constitution. And then ha there have been uh, six elections, five elections, sorry, in which the winner of the popular vote did not have a majority of electoral votes. And the most recent one, of course, was 2016. Uh, and then uh, the 2001, as we remember very well, Grover Cleveland in 1888, um, and then 1876 and 1824, we're gonna talk about a little bit more because those elections were really complicated and in some ways um, more significantly a violation of what we would hope would be accomplished. Um, and so 24 is up there in the one in the House of Representatives as well. And so is 1876. So those two are key and 1800. So I'm gonna talk about those first three. So these are the people who were the candidates, the top candidates in those two elections. Uh, this is Aaron Burr on the left and uh, he died in 1836, and you have Thomas Jefferson on the right. These were the uh, federal, they were called the uh, Democrat Republican candidates. Um, and the Federalists, of course, really wasn't a party early on. Washington himself was, they were all opposed to factions and parties, as we've said, but they began to coalesce around Hamilton and uh, Jefferson, and then, Ham uh, sorry, Jefferson and uh, Madison were on one side of, of a set of issues, and Hamilton, Adams, Washington, sort of on another side as things began to emerge. And the Federalists was the name for the people who were supporting the Constitution's adoption. And uh, that was the name that continued to be associated with them for the next 20, 20 years before that party disappeared. In the election of 1800, um, in 1796, as you know, Jefferson came in second. We talked about that last week uh, to Adams. And so you had a, a candidate, the first two candidates who had to serve together as a team of president and vice president, even though Jefferson as vice president had campaigned vigorously against Adams, uh, they had to work together, but mostly they didn't work together. Jefferson went home and tried to undermine Adams pretty consistently. Uh, and in the election of 1800, it was again Adams, uh, sorry, yes, Adams and Pinckney, a different Pinckney, a cousin from South Carolina, and on the other side of the, of the ticket, so to speak, was um, Jefferson and Burr. So this was a, the, the, by now they're kind of real parties with platforms and it was a really vicious and personal campaign. But as you can see from the map, it, it, there was also kind of a regional area too. The Federalists were much more um, powerful in the North and the Democrat Republicans in the South. And um, I think I mentioned to you before they, that the 1796 election was also vicious, but this one really got into personal attacks on Adams and on Jefferson. Jefferson was an atheist, gonna steal your Bibles, as I said last time. Uh, Adams was a monarchist who wanted to marry his son to the princess of England and have a hereditary monarchy. There are all kinds of things uh, said about the whole thing. So in the Electoral College, however, the um, Democrat Republicans won an absolute majority. They won. And had they managed to remember to throw away one of their electoral votes instead of for Burr, who was intended to be the vice president, uh, if they'd voted for another person, then Jefferson would have won because he had a majority, but they didn't do that. So unlike the 1796 election, if you recall, where uh, Jefferson came in second because the Federalists uh, did throw away some of their second votes to make sure that Adams would be first, right? Because you recall at this point, there was no differentiation between the president and the vice president, just the top two vote getters, one first one's president, second one's vice president. That was their original plan, which obviously had a flaw, which they saw in 1796. But the same situation was true in 1800. So the Republicans had won the absolute majority, but uh, it was a tie. So uh, here's the situation. And um, they, it ended up going to the House, even though someone had a majority, again, it was a tie. Now, by this time in this election, only six states chose electors by popular vote, uh, but they were all pledged to somebody. So there were no independents in this election. So Kentucky, Maryland, North Carolina, Rhode Island, Tennessee, and Virginia, all uh, elected by popular vote by this time. Um, so Adams, and Pinckney had 65 and 64 votes, respectively, as you can see. And they had those votes because, uh, I just can't see that, but because they managed to um, have one of the Federalists vote for John Jay. But Jefferson Burtai was 73, and so it was into the House. So here are the uh, key actors. 
as we are now in the House with a contingent election. So here are Burr and Jefferson. And then you notice the person on the right is Alexander Hamilton. And Alexander Hamilton played a major role in this behind the scenes. By this time, though, you just a word or two about Hamilton is that, uh, you know, he and, and, um, and Burr were both on Washington's staff. Uh, during the war, they were both really brilliant students early on. They both met at the what became Princeton was University of uh, New Jersey. They uh, they were lawyers in New York City. They actually worked on some cases together. They were both brilliant. But the thing about Burr that and all of this is in Ron Chernow's book that I was talking about last week. He does such a great job of explaining all of the nuances about both of them. Um, that that Burr never unlike virtually every one of the other founders and framers, he did not publish much about what he thought. He didn't send pamphlets. He wasn't explaining his positions everywhere. He played his cards pretty close to his vest, which made people feel like that he was too much of a pragmatist, more of an equivocator. They didn't really uh, know where he was. And the line that Lin-Manuel Miranda pulls out in the, in the musical is, you know, Burke keeps saying, talk less, smile more. That's his advice to Hamilton. Talk less, smile more. Don't take positions. Um, he did have... Um, some papers with his daughter. He had a, he had one daughter. Her mother had died in childbirth, Theodosia, and uh, Theodosia was the name of his daughter as well. And she she died in a shipwreck in 1812, and apparently had a whole bunch of his papers with him. So they were lost, uh, if in fact they had existed. Um, so by 7 to 1800, you need to know what had happened to Hamilton because Hamilton was he he stopped being treasurer, the first treasurer, secretary of the treasury. He had established essentially set up the government and the revenue. Uh, the he the, the um, Coast Guard, uh, terrorists, it was amazing. He was the first person in the country probably to read uh, the brand new book in uh, 1776 called The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith and the Explanation of Capitalism. Uh, he read it, understood it and implemented its principles. Whereas, you know, he and Jefferson never saw what eye to eye, Jefferson didn't trust Hamilton. He didn't trust banks. He didn't trust cities. Uh, primarily because planters were often in debt to banks, they were in debt to the British banks, and then it, later the New York banks. And uh, so this was something that uh, Jefferson was sure that Hamilton was stealing money uh, for himself, lining his pockets. Uh, anyway, so what happened was uh, that in around 17, I'm going to say it was uh, 93 or 9, 94, Hamilton ended up, he had a bit of a Bill Clinton zipper problem, or you might call it button problem, I guess, at that point. And so he ended up uh, having an affair with a woman named Mariah Reynolds. Her husband happened to work sort of part-time for the Department of the Treasury. And um, so he, he was cheating on his wife, uh, and it was a shameful affair. However, when the information got out to the Jeffersonians, Madison, Monroe, uh, they confronted him and accused him of of having, he, they didn't know about the affair. They knew about the, her husband and figured there was some kind of chicanery, financial chicanery going on and that he was using the treasury for his own personal enrichment. He was appalled by that because Hamilton was one of the most totally upright, virtuous, except for this little button problem, uh, person, and especially in terms of financial situations. So he was so upset about this that he, uh, it, first of all, he confronted them and he told them he was having this affair and there was nothing about it that had to do with financial peccadillos. Well, they accepted that. But then, then later it came to Jefferson's um, attention and he decided to use it. And there was a, um, it, it was published. The information was published and it was published uh, contrary to his agreement he'd made with, that Hamilton made with Monroe to a Jefferson backed news, partisan newspaper publisher named Calendar who went ahead and published this thing. Well, at, he kind of got Jefferson back, the same guy, because he's the person who also published about Sally Hemings and Jefferson about three or four years later. But, but Hamilton's answer to this, against all the advice of his friends, was to write a very long pamphlet in which he explained that he had not taken a penny and he was utterly honest in that regard, but he had had an affair. And so he published this information and his friends were like, oh, for the love of God, Alexander, just let it go, it'll blow over. No, I have to clear my name, clear my name. Well, that was the death knell for any of his ambitions to being president or any other office. He was finished just practicing law. His wife, of course, was extremely loyal, was devastated, but she stayed, he died, of course, in 1804 when he was killed by Burr in the, in the um, duel, but she lived another 50 years. And she, she was completely loyal to him and his memory. Uh, and, and again, if you've watched the, the musical, I think that, um, that that gets carried very well by Lin-Manuel Miranda. At any rate, 
when when Jefferson does become president, one of the first thing here after 1800, he first thing he does, he tells Albert Gallatin, his secretary of the treasury, I want you to find out where Hamilton put all that money and get all that money back that I know he's stolen. And I want you to dismantle the entire financial system of the United States because it's corrupt. So Gallatin went off to do both of those things. And he came back to Jefferson and said, I'm really sorry to tell you, bud. First of all, he never took a penny. There is no money missing. And secondly, it's a brilliant system and we can't possibly get rid of it. So um, that didn't make Jefferson happy, but that's what Gallatin did. So that's what you need to know about Hamilton. He's out of politics, except he still has a lot of friends and he has a lot of influence. And that's when it becomes important. So here we are in the House of Representatives where every state, remember, has one vote. That's what it says in the constitution one vote, talk about unrepresentative decisions. So here's the first vote they took in the House of Representatives. And if your state had both, had couldn't decide uh, about who to cast their one vote for, you got no vote. So Maryland and Vermont had a tied delegation, so they had no vote. Um, Georgia had some kind of irregularity in their votes that were reported, but Jefferson was opening them because he was the vice president and he just accepted them. They were votes for him and Burr and he accepted them and nobody argued. I'm not a big fan of Jefferson, I like to say, but just, I did not know that till this afternoon actually when I read it in a different book and I'm like one more strike against Jefferson for me. But at any rate, so here they are and you're in the house and what are you gonna do? 16 states, nine votes needed. Jefferson had eight at the beginning, Burr had six, and you had nothing there. So somebody had to give, or there would not be a president chosen, obviously. What would we do? Well, what happened is they voted 35 times. They took 35 ballots in the House. No change, no change, no change, no change. So during all this time, of course, Burr is very quiet, but he's getting pressure. People are saying, you know, you were supposed to be the vice president anyway. You know, why are you, well, he said, I'm not going to interfere at all if the people want me to be president. So, you know, Burr does not come off as well as you might expect since, and Jefferson was furious because everybody knew this was the deal, president, vice president, even though it didn't specify. So uh, there were various people trying to figure out what they could possibly do to get out because if they didn't, now mind you, remember because of the lame duck situation where the new Congress doesn't come in until March, right? And, and this we're doing now in January, uh, so it's a it's a Federalist Congress, Federalist House, and they've been replaced by Democrats in the election. The Democrats had actually won the majority, uh, the uh, Republican Democrats, the Jeffersonians. But so it's the Federalists making this determination, essentially. And um, so the idea was, how do we break this logjam? What do we do? And there was a guy named Bayard, James Bayard from um, Delaware, who was... Uh, a single representative, and he was kind of, uh, he was a Federalist, but he was sort of maneuvering, and he apparently went to Burr and said, hey, you know, um, we'll uh, fit, do something with you if you would do this. At any rate, Burr denied all this. It was like, you know, could, will Jefferson make a deal? And so there was some conversation apparently with Jefferson, like maybe you would not get rid of all the Federalist office holders when you became president, maybe you'd make some kind of a deal with the Federalists to do it. Anyway, but nothing had happened until Finally, um, Alexander Hamilton got involved, and Alexander Alexander Hamilton was appealed to by the Federalists. What you know? What do you feel we should do? And finally, he came down on the side of Jefferson, and he said his famous line that, you know, that uh, although he had never agreed with Jefferson on anything, uh, he at least had principles, and Burr didn't have any principles. And, Burr, and of course, this really set the thing in motion between Burr and Hamilton. That's going to end up, you know, four years later in the duel. Uh, there are a num number of other political issues within New York that they also had. So uh, finally on the 36th ballot, uh, they voted uh, for Jefferson. It went uh, to Jefferson. The Federalists changed their several Federalists didn't vote. They made it happen. It came out that way. Uh, so this was the, the conclusion. Had they, one of the things pushing them was that if they didn't get a president by March 4th, they didn't know what they would do. And so potentially it might be John Marshall, who was a Federalist and was Secretary of State. You know, nobody knew. So there's a lot of pressure to get something resolved, and it was. So then the question is, who else is involved in it? Well, here we have now the same people that I showed you before, right? Only there were slightly different people. What we've got here is Burr on the left, Hamilton, or, or sorry, Jefferson and Hamilton. Here we go. 1800. Can we get back? 
Politics, please. Yo, every action has its equal opposite reaction. Jefferson and John Madison. Adams, that's the man. I love the guy, but he's in traction. Poor Alexander Hamilton. He is missing in action. So now I'm facing Aaron Burr with his own faction. He's very attractive in the North. New Yorkers like his chances. He's not very forthcoming on any particular stances. Ask him a question and glances off. He obfuscates. He dances. And they say I'm a Francophile. At least they know I know where France is. Thomas, that's the problem. See, they see Burr as a less extreme view. You need to change course. The key endorsement might redeem you. Who did you have in mind? Don't laugh. Who is it? You used to work on the same staff. Uh, it might be nice, it might be nice to get Hamilton on your side. It might be nice, it might be nice to get Hamilton on your side. Talk less, sir. smile more. Sir. Don't let them know what you're against or what you're for. Sir. Shake hands with him. Sir. Charm her. Ladies, tell your husbands, vote for me. I don't like Adams. Well, he's going to lose. That's just defeatist. And Jefferson in, in love, love with France. France. Yeah, he's so elitist. I like that Aaron Burr. I can't believe we're here with him. He seems approachable. I go could grab a beer with him. Dear Mr. Hamilton, your fellow Federalists would like to know how you'll be voting. It's quiet. Dear Mr. Hamilton, John Adams doesn't stand a chance of who are you promoting. Well, if it isn't Aaron Burr, sir, Alexander, you've created quite a stir, sir. I'm going door to door. You're openly campaigning. The important thing about that election is it was resolved and it is, I think, with all of its incredible complications, the first peaceful transfer of power, not just in our country, but actually almost anywhere in history between rival political parties. And uh, it, it's pretty amazing. And it was one of the things you know that we were talking about this year uh, as being people anxious about this history that started, well, in, it, essentially it started in, in, in 1800 because in 1796, uh, Adams was a successor, had been the vice president of Washington, right? And was, even though there weren't political parties, he was a continuation of those philosophies. So 1800 was a pretty incredible test for the country and we passed despite all of the potential areas of problems. However, it was pretty obvious to everybody that it was a serious problem with this business of the top two people. And so there was a, an, a, an amendment to the constitution uh, that was promulgated and passed quite quickly. Um, for, for amendments, and, um, and that is the 12th Amendment. Okay, so um, we have the next election that's sort of interesting, quickly zip over, is um, the 1860 election where Lincoln was elected with only Northern votes. That was the first time that that had happened. He only had 39.8% of the popular vote, but he did have a clear majority of the electoral votes and he had 18 states. Uh, and of course his first running mate was Hannibal Hamlin of Maine. And had he not picked Andrew Johnson, tried to balance the ticket, the guy from Tennessee, right? Former Democrat, the only person in the Senate who'd been a Southern Democrat that, who stayed in the union, he picked Johnson. Had he picked Hamlin when he was assassinated, Hamlin would have become president, which I think would have been probably, I don't know a whole lot about Hannibal Hamlin, but he couldn't have been worse than Andrew Johnson, who up until recently has been pretty much known as the second worst president in our history. Buchanan winning the prize. And now, of course, we may have another competitor uh, for that uh, award. But a history will have to determine that. But at any rate, um, you see that there were four different candidates. Uh, it was about the issue of slavery. The Democrats split into Southern Democrats and Northern Democrats, which meant that, that uh, Stephen Douglas of Illinois only got one state, 12 votes. And so Lincoln won. But you can see uh, you can see how the, the geographic stuff and that the brown places are territories who didn't get to vote yet, right? Okay, so we have the Civil War Amendments and the most important one here with the 13th Amendment abolished slavery in 1865, uh, the 15th in 1870, the right to vote for all male citizens, uh, regardless of race, conditions of servitude in the past, whatever. The 14th actually has a really interesting uh, history here, and it's been incredibly important in the Supreme Court. It was passed in 1866. Um, 
And the first part applies the Bill of Rights to the states, which is significant. And this second part is really significant right here, Article Section 2. It was, it's never been implemented. And I have thought to myself, I am no Supreme Court justice, nor likely to be one, but I, this makes a lot of sense to me. And th what this provision says is when the right to vote at any election uh, for the choice of electors is denied to any of the male inhabitants of the state or in any way abridged, except for participation in rebellion or other crime, the basis of representation therein shall be reduced in the proportion in which the number of such male citizens shall bear to the whole number of male citizens, 21 years of age in such state. So essentially what that's, well, I'll just come back to that in a minute. Article three is the person that says, if you've been an insurrection or a rebellion against the country, you cannot be an elector, nor can you vote. Although that can be taken away by Congress, that disability, which it was for many of the Confederates, but it was designed for the Confederate people who had served in the army who had previously sworn an oath to the office. If president, this is one that was being discussed several months ago, that if President Trump had been convicted of impeach, his impeach, he was impeached, yes, but he'd been convicted, that he might have been, he would have been, could have been ruled ineligible because of this uh, section of the 14th Amendment. And then, um, whoops, sorry, I'm too far. So I want to go back to the second part that I just told you, which reduces the representation for states suppressing or denying voting rights. Now, denying voting rights or abridging, which I think you could talk about suppressing votes, right? You should could make a case on that. And Thaddeus Stevens Mass of uh, Pennsylvania, he in the debate on this section, and he was a radical Republican abolitionist and true believer in the Reconstruction that was being established. And a Dartmouth said, grad. And a Dartmouth grad, small college, but there are those of us who love it. Uh, that would be a diff that would be Daniel Webster. Uh, the second section I consider the most important in the article. It fixes the basis of representation in Congress. If any state shall exclude any of her adult male citizens from the elective franchise or abridge that right, she shall forfeit her right to representation in the same proportion. The effect of this provision will be either to compel the states to grant universal suffrage or so shear them of their power as to keep them forever in a hopeless minority in the national government, both legislative and executive. That's what he hoped for, but it's never been implemented ever, as far as I know, or I've read anywhere. So, uh, you know, they've, they've gone the Southern states because of this from their three fifths uh, compromise advantage in the house and electoral college to a disadvantage if they did not give their black citizens, uh, male citizens, uh, the right to vote. So that was what that was about. Okay, so um, I wanna talk about 1876 before we take our little break here, because 1876 is the real corrupt bargain. I taught a whole class on this and it is fascinating. Absolutely fascinating to me. So these are the people of 1876. I mean, this is a pernicious, pernicious and corrupt election. So in 1876, Grant is just going out of office after two terms. Grant himself was never corrupt, but he did have a, an administration that had definite problems with corruption, partly because he was such a bad judge of character. Uh, he was a great judge of military character and many of the men who betrayed him and the government were his, had been his officers uh, and they served well in that capacity, but they were not good in terms of the civilian administration. And so um, people were tired of the corruption and there'd been a lot of publicity about it. And so these people running, Rutherford B. Hayes, former Civil War officer, which was the case all the way to the end of the century, basically, at least one of the candidates had been in the Civil War, and governor of Ohio, Republican, and Samuel J. Tilden, Democrat, governor of New York. Now, Tilden had not been in the war, but he was a uh, crusading reformer against Tammany Hall, the corruption in New York City in particular. And as a Democrat, that was his thing. The th idea is, look, the Republicans have been corrupt with the Grant administration, get a Democrat. The Democrats were swimming uphill, however, because the war was still pretty fresh in people's minds. And the Republicans always campaigned from the war on practically to the end of the century, what they call the bloody shirt. They waved the bloody shirt, which was, you know, this is the shirt your son died at Appomattox or, and he died, you know, at, at Gettysburg. And it was a democratic bullet that killed him and a democratic bill killed your father and a democratic bullet, you know, because the South was solidly democratic, right? And the Democratic, the Democrats are traitors. And so any Northern Democrat, anybody running on that ticket after the war even still had a real heavy row to hoe to get past that, that particular argument. But anyway, because of the corruption issue, it was a close election. And the other piece you need to know is that by this time in 1876, 
we had all but three of the former Confederate states. It's a little hard to see those. I'm sorry, I put black on them, but it didn't come out. Anyway, these are the, the Confederate states and that under reconstruction that had been readmitted into, to, into the country and redeemed by the Democrats. The local Democrats called it redeeming the state, taking it back from the Republicans and the military that was there, granted sent the military in. The three states were, were mo had not yet been readmitted to the, to the union were uh, South Carolina, Florida, and, and Louisiana. And those states had military governors and they had enormous amounts of chicanery going on during this election uh, and, and physical violence, intimidating voters on both sides, but mostly the Democrats, the local Democrats against the Republicans and the black people who were black men who were mostly voting Republican uh, for the most part. But this was the circumstance in which, in which things were happening. And uh, in order to become a, 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 a back in the United States, in the Union, you had to agree to those, to those um, three, uh, um, amendments to the constitution, which was a real problem for some of the Southern Democrats, they didn't wanna do that. So here, the, the night after the election had happened, here's what we had. This is the night of the election, popular vote, right? The results as the election night was Tilden had 184 votes. He had the popular vote to 184, uh, that should have added up to 184. Hayes, 165. So clearly, you know, Tilden is one vote short of a majority, one vote. Sure, of a majority as of election night. And you can see the states where they are. You can also see the states with the black marks around them. Those are the states that had disputed electoral uh, slates that they'd sent into Washington. They hadn't yet as of election night. But because of a man, and this is a guy I really wish they'd make a movie about and write a terrific, Chernow needs to write a biography of him. His name is, was called, he was called Devil Dan Sickles. Probably went to Dartmouth, Mark, I don't know. But Devil Dan Sickles, was uh, his career, it, it, he's, it's astonishing what he's done. I do have a book by, about him, it wasn't very well written, but a fascinating guy. During the Civil War, he was one of the guys who raised with money, his own money, raised a regiment, took it off. He's one of those political generals that drove Grant crazy because they didn't really understand military discipline or care about it. And at Gettysburg, Sickles took his regiment or his group of men, or large it was, against the orders of Meade down into what's called the Peach Orchard if you were a student of the Gettysburg battle down to the peach on the second day of the battle, way ahead of the lines, completely against the plan of the battle and got slaughtered. All kinds of people died in that men and he got his leg shot off. And so he got taken off in an ambulance with a horse, right? And he made sure they picked up his leg. And so he took the leg back with him to Washington DC and he put the leg eventually in a museum. The leg is still in a museum today in Washington DC. And every New Year's Eve, he would bring some friends over to take to drink champagne with his leg. That was one of the things that Devil Dan Sickles did. He did a whole bunch of other things. At one point, subsequent to the war, he went off to London. Uh, he was an ambassador to Spain, maybe. He took his mistress and passed her off and introduced her to Queen Victoria under the name of the wife of one of his colleagues. Uh, he, um, he shot and killed Francis Scott Key's uh, son, right in front of the White House, basically, uh, because he, he accused Francis Scott Key's son of having an affair with his Dan Sickles wife. He, he were witnesses and everything. He went on trial. He was acquitted for the first time in American history on the temporary insanity. Uh, and so he was a very important and interesting celebrity. Now, why is he important in this election? Because he just came back from Europe for some reason. He happened to stop into the Republican headquarters the night of the election. The Republican uh, head of the party for the country had taken a bottle of whiskey and gone to bed. And so there was nobody in the office. And Dan Sickles, who had absolutely no right to do that, went through the paperwork, the telegraph, the telegram stuff that they'd gotten, and saw that they could maybe change things in Louisiana and in uh, South Carolina and in Florida if they sent people down there to find electoral votes, right? And so they sent people down and so did the uh, Democrats. And so that was added to the mix of what was going on following the election. It was a little bit like this election, the only other one where people were trying to change results, but only in these three states. Uh, and, and so in the end, what, what those three states sent to Washington DC were two separate electoral slates, all right? A Democrat and a Republican one. Each signed off, each saying, this is the real one from Louisiana. So they had conflicting, things coming to DC, right? The, the other thing is Oregon. Oregon ended up as relatively new state with one disputed um, 
and I think this is sort of interesting and I'll sort of be an Oregonian now, but basically what happened is the, the governor of, of Oregon was a Democrat. The top three, they only have three votes and the top three electors were Republicans. And so a guy named Cronin was number four and he was a Democrat, right? So one of the rules, if you remember, of course, from the constitution is you cannot be an elector if you have a public office, a federal, if you hold any federal office. So one of a guy named Watts was a assistant postmaster. And so the democratic governor said, You're, you can't be an elector, I am throwing you off the ticket and I'm replacing you with Watts. Sorry, I, I'm replacing with Cronin. Cronin is the guy he put in there, who's the Democrat, sorry. He threw Watts off. Watts said, I'll resign as postmaster, assistant postmaster. He said, too late. You were postmaster before when it was elected, so that's invalid. So the governor sends two uh, Republicans, one Democratic electoral vote, and the Republicans sent three, right? So I love this little poem that was in an Oregon paper. There's an elector named Cronin who has set the Republicans groaning, for he was elected and Watts was rejected, and that's what's the matter with Cronin. If you like puns, I'm sure you like that. Um, okay, so what are they going to do? They've got basically four states with competing electoral slates that have come to it. So here's what the House argued. The House was now Democratic, they had Democrat majority. The House said, hey, in the Constitution, we're the people who get contested uh, elections, clearly. So we're the ones who will decide which of these uh, envelopes to open. The Senate was Republican and the Senate said, no, 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 no. It says very clearly that the president of the Senate, who is the vice president of the United States, right, opens the envelopes. Well, obviously that means he has to choose which envelopes to open, right? And so he gets to choose the Republican. Well, it's a complete stalemate, argument, all kinds of stuff going on, people trying to figure out what to do. Uh, and so the big, it was a huge election, as I said, 81.8%. So finally, Grant signed, that they, they cobbled together a compromise called the Electoral Commission Act, which, which there was no constitutional basis for. But the Electoral Commission Act said that essentially there was going to be a 15 member commission. It would have five House members, three Democrats, two Republicans, five Senate members, three Republicans, two Democrats, and five people from the Supreme Court. There were seven on the court at the time, two appointed by Democrats, two appointed by Republicans, and then th those two, those four would pick the fifth, and that would be the swing vote, right? That would be the person. And they figured it was, it was supposed to be David Davis, who had been actually Lincoln's campaign manager, and he, someone said no one, even Davis himself, knew who he was going to think. He was genuinely neutral, okay? So the Illinois legislature, which was full of Democrats, thought, aha, we know what we'll do. And so because they still picked senators and because Davis had sort of wanted to be a senator instead of a, chief uh, of a Supreme Court justice, they said, okay, we've just elected you, David Davis, to be an Illinois senator. It was a vacancy or some sort. And so they figured that would swing him over to their side, right? Instead, what it did is it backfired because Davis said, oh, okay, well, then I'm resigning right now from the Supreme Court and I'm going to go be the senator. And so I can't be involved in this. So now they had to choose one more Supreme Court justice and they chose a guy who was a Republican. So you've got an eight to seven partisan basis. But nonetheless, you are saying to yourself, for the love of God, he only needs one vote, Tilden, one vote to get enough out of the 20 disputed votes. But the commission made decisions. They met in secret for the most part. They, the commission made the decision they wouldn't look behind any votes, meaning they, wouldn't, they didn't take any evidence about corruption or violence or intimidation. They were just going to, basically what they did is they voted on a party basis, straight party line. And the vote was, you will not be surprised that uh, Rutherford B. Hayes got all 20 of the votes, all 20 of those votes, not one went to Tilden. Well, that outraged the Democrats and the Democratic states. There were governors threatening to call the militia, there was uh, stuff like um, th this, this cartoon, Tilden or Blood, right? It was called a compromise, but it, people were up in arms and it could have been another civil war already. When they met at the Wormley Hotel, I love the name of that hotel in Washington, in a smoke-filled back room, some Republicans and Democrats, and they made a deal. And the deal was that the Democratic House would accept the results of the commission if, if the Republican president, Rutherford B. Hayes, would pull out all the military from the South and end reconstruction. And in other words, basically, and they agreed. Rutherford B. Hayes agreed and the Republicans agreed. And so what that was is they condemned the black citizens of those countries, the newly freed slaves of those states to a hundred years of segregation of Jim Crow 
That was the result of that bargain. And if that isn't a corrupt bargain, I don't know what is. And so subsequently, uh, it was, um, you see here that the environment in the country, people were tired of reconstruction. They were tired of supporting the military, occupying. And so here you have the ignorant vote, a Thomas Nass cartoon. And this is the Democrats uh, claim that the white, that, that the Republicans were having these uh, black voters, they were ignorant voters, and the uh, Republicans claim the Democrats had the ignorant whites. That, by the way, is Nast's picture of an Irish person. And so the Irish were the ignorant uh, vote for the um, Democrats and the blacks for the rights. And so here is how it came down when they finally did the final bargain. 50-50, 184 to 185, the closest electoral vote in our history. And, um, and, and Tilden had the, the majority of the popular vote. So that's another election in which the popular vote did not work. Republicans paid a price for it though. Uh, another such victory and I'm done, Pyrrhic victory, right? The Republican elephant had been defeated at that point the Democrats were, were uh, illustrated by a tiger. Uh, because Rutherford B. Hayes was called rather fraud Hayes. Uh, and, and there was an enormous un unhappiness with this result and for a lot of good reasons, but it was accepted. And that is important. It's important what the thing, one thing I wanna say to you just is that the tiredness of the country with the civil war and with this reconstruction was sort of manifested by a reconciliation, but it was reconciliation not by the South facing what they had done to blacks, not by ex accepting that slavery was gone and that slavery had been bad, but by whites coming together. It was a white reconciliation. And the lost, the lost cause, that myth began to be pumped out by the South. You remember all those statues, the Confederate statues, all those came in the 90s and again in the 20s. And this is all about the lost cause, the white supremacy that was being pumped out here. And, and, and essentially you can say that the South lost the war, but they won the peace and they won the history books. And, and the symbol of that in many ways to me is Grant's funeral, which was amazing. He, he died in 1885. It was the largest funeral in, in the history of New York to that point and maybe ever. His, the cortege was seven miles long with former soldiers marching that on their, paid their own way to come and do that. But his pallbearers were, uh, they were uh, you know, Sherman, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman and Philip Sheridan and Simon Bolivar Buckner, a, a Confederate general and Joseph Johnson, the Confederate general, all of these guys went to West Point. They had been friends, they'd been separated, but now they are together. And by the way, Dan Sickles did ride in the funeral cortege and he had pulled out his leg and put it on the back of his saddle. So his leg was able to ride as well in the Grant funeral. Okay, so I want to talk, I'm gonna, I, the other uh, uh, times when the popular vote was uh, the one, 1888, uh, the person with the popular vote didn't win. Uh, nobody really had any issues with that at the time. And then the entire 20th century, the Electoral College had no impact, essentially. Popular vote winner won, and it was not an issue that anybody paid any attention to at all. Till we get to 2000, we all remember that election. And all of a sudden people are like, whoa, this is important. And, and how come Florida has these pregnant, you know, hanging chads? And why can't, the, you know, the, the whole crazy butterfly ballots, why can't we have a federal rule about it? Because of the constitution that the elections are run by the states. And so people began to pay some attention to that. And a, a switch of just a few votes would have made a difference in electoral college and, and Gore who won the popular vote would have in fact won. So we get to 2016. And in 2016, you remember, that was an exciting election. And I wanna, we're gonna start now talking about the, where's my cursor? The, the uh, electoral college impact on in the 20th and the 21st century. So you can see this, right? This is the 2016 election and the margin of victory, which was electoral only, not popular vote, right? Hillary Clinton clearly won the popular vote by nearly 3 million votes. And you look here down at the bottom of that cartoon, the 78,000 votes in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania in 2016 that gave Trump the vote, you know, outweighed 2,800,000 votes from Hillary Clinton. So that is the, the disproportionate thing. So there have been efforts to change the Electoral College. Uh, the, in 1804, there was the fix. That we talked about the president, vice president. 1933, we know that they changed the date of the election and the date that Congress began. And in 1961, with the 23rd Amendment gave Washington, D.C. three votes uh, in the Electoral College, although it doesn't have uh, any, it doesn't have any a congressional actual thing. There have been 700 amendments 
to try to modify or abolish the Electoral College. None of them have made it to the states, 700. So following 1876, clearly there's something needed to be done, right? They managed to get themselves together by 1887 to have something called the Electoral Count Act. It was a weak and muddled act. They, 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 there were people who were advocating eliminating the Electoral College. They didn't do that. In the final analysis, all they did was try to clarify the dates when, when certain things had to be submitted. And they did not in any way settle who decides what an official tally from a state is, which was, of course, the problem in 1876, right? So they did, they did nothing to solve that problem. But uh, the papers were really unhappy with the law. They said the Electoral College is clumsy, inefficient, and dangerous, too perilous to endure. It's the source of all the trouble now, and it promises to be of still more trouble in the future. And there was a guy named Oliver Morton of Indiana. I was Republican. Uh, he really wanted to abolish the Electoral College. He saw it as anti-Republican and anti-Democratic in the true sense of the word. He wanted to end winner take all, but he died at age 54 in 1877. So it, his effort was gone. Uh, basically, the houses didn't support it. And, and um, one of the arguments against changing it was, you have a false assumption that our government was intended to represent the will of the majority of the whole people of the United States. And that comes right back to the, what we talked about the Heather Cox article this morning, right? There are still people who are saying, well, that's, you know, nobody ever intended it to be democratic. One person, one vote isn't really a principle that matters. Uh, so essentially, um, once again, as after 1824, an unpopular and disputed election outcome failed to produce any changes to the electoral system. It, it just didn't happen. And um, essentially, it's kind of like the rain, the rain on the roof, you know, whose ox is being gored for one thing. Some parties think they ben benefit and when they think it's their party, they don't want to change it. And, you know, you don't want to fix the hole in your roof when it's raining because you don't want to be up there when it's raining. And when it's not raining, you don't care because it's not, you know, leaking. So it's a kind of a similar problem we've been in. The next uh, and most serious effort to change it was in 1970s uh, with Richard Nixon. <clears throat> senator Birch Bayh, the young senator, 1962, he became the chair of the subcommittee in the constitutional amendments after K Kefauver died. And he kept that subcommittee going. And he said, you know, national popular vote is the next logical outgrowth of the persistent and inevitable movement in this country toward the democratic ideal of universal suffrage and all votes counting equal. So it was the first time that an advocate had actually chaired that committee. And um, he had 18 co-sponsors on his bill to abolish it. Um, and um, he had accepted a runoff because the American Bar Association said, well, we need to have a, a runoff. He had uh, the majority leader, Mike Mansfield, and the minority leader, Everett Dirksen. Some of you guys remember these names because we're now not in history anymore, except for Leah, we're actually in current events for us. And so we remember these guys and they, they support us bipartisan the house, the Chamber of Commerce supported it, American Bar Association supported the elimination. And the experts testified that the Electoral College did not help small states. And that's one of the persistent myths that somehow small states benefit from the Electoral College. They do not. In the 1968 election, George Wallace, if you remember from Alabama, he ran as a third party candidate. He won five states and 45 electoral votes. It was not enough to block Nixon, uh, who had won the clear majority and, and who beat Humphrey by less than 1% of the popular vote. But they, the, the, uh, the, the Southerners, uh, the, Wallace wanted to get into the House of Representatives, just as the Trump people after the effect, this election, were trying to get enough disputed electoral votes to get into the House, right? Um, and so this, this was a similar tactic, but of course with Trump, it's after the vote, not before the vote. Here's my coolest fact about this, these, these hearings in the early 70s. So Jeanette Rankin, you guys remember that name? First female, first woman elected to Congress, elected from Wyoming. And so she was elected in 1916. She was still alive and she came at age 89 to testify to these congressional com hearings. And here's what she said. And when they were arguing about, you know, we're gonna need a runoff and that'll be a double election and that's really expensive. She said, you're not gonna need a runoff. There's something now being invented called a computer. And so you can just use these computers and you won't need that. And I just thought, awesome, an 89 year old person had a wide enough vision, broad enough horizons, yeah, uh, in order to understand that and to see that so far in advance. It passed the house 83% that, that amendment to go to the states, but the Senate, it failed. The Senate, the Southern senators filibustered it and there were enough, uh, some of the Northern uh, senators 
thought they were pressured into saying some of the minority groups within those northern states said, hey, winner take all really works for us because we can be a swing state and this will stop our being able to use that. And the South, as I said, was united in opposition. And what uh, <clears throat> Bai said was, it's a blatant case of a little band of willful men who fear and are therefore thwarting both popular will and the political process that they extol. And that is true. So the question is, for or against it? You saw those videos maybe, I don't know if you had a chance to read the articles, but essentially to just sort of sum up, uh, it's admitted that there have been problems from the inception, was never intended to function the way it does. They expected electors to be independent, as we said. Um, and they expected uh, the 12th Amendment changed it and, it's, and established the parties as being significant in terms of pledging people to it, even though originally Madison wanted the president to be acting for the people, not the states. And then the winner take all versus the proportional plan, the main Nebraska plan, which Congress uh, by, by congressional district in 1836, actually Hamilton proposed a constitutional amendment in 1836 to get rid of winner take all and to have the proportional like Maine and Nebraska, but it didn't go anywhere because he was, that was the year he actually died. So the problems with it now depend on what you value as an individual, whether you think this is a problem or not. One, presidents win without a popular vote mandate. That can happen. Number two, individual votes are not equal. It's a violation of one person, one vote, but, but some people obviously don't consider that to be a problem. Number three, minorities are disadvantaged in terms of the urbans. Many minorities are in urbans, more of them. And so their, their, their votes are sort of, they have, their votes count less because of the dense population. Their votes are submerged. Number four, focuses campaigns on swing or battleground states. 75% of Americans live in states where most major candidates never campaign, which completely depresses the turnout registration. And those swing states, they change, but they are not representative of the rest of the country. So what are the arguments for the Electoral College? This woman named Tara Ross has written a book, Why We Need the Electoral College in 2017. That was the one I found, the only actual book. And she's also on that one of those videos, clips that you got. So these are her arguments. It combats majority tyranny. Uh, it supports federalism, preserves the states as discrete entities. It promotes more equal regional representation. I don't understand that one. It protects the interests of sparsely populated states because it requires campaigning everywhere. That is just simply flat not true. Uh, it preserves the importance of political parties. And uh, that, is, that is true. Uh, and it means we will only have a two party system. It, it supports the two party system. Very hard for a third party to get any electoral votes. Uh, and it keeps us from what she sees as a bad system, the parliamentary system, which is very fragmented. Um, and it keeps us, it's, it's an even keel that keeps us, keeps us going um, on, on, a, on a straight course because even though we are very, very different in many parts of our country and it decentralizes our election. So it prevents um, hacking uh, and cheating. So if there's a problem in the debate that I watched a couple of weeks ago, this guy made an unfortunate reference. He said, if there's a, it's like watertight compartments in a ship. Each state is independent. So if there's a problem, say in Florida, it won't impact the election. Everybody went, what? How about 2000? He might've picked a different state. It would have been better for him. But what he's basically saying is the corruption in the state won't leak over and get into the others because it's all, Americans have forgotten the importance of state sovereignty. Um, and essentially, um, you know, it's, an, it's as good a system as we're going to get. It was enshrined in the Electoral College, it was in the Constitution because the founders thought it, the framers thought it was the best. That is not true. Many of the framers uh, were, did not like the system and many of them thought the whole system wasn't gonna last very long. And she likes the fact that it guarantees certainty to the outcome of the presidential election. Hmm, um, yes and no. Uh, and, um, the other problem is, as it, in one of the articles, is that it could allow, if you had a national popular vote, you could have a like 27 candidates and as a person with a very small majority, plurality, I should say, plurality would win. And that is possible uh, if you don't have, um, if you don't have uh, ranked choice voting, which Maine is smart enough to have. And ranked choice voting is exactly what we should have, I have come to believe, in the national popular vote. If we had ranked choice voting, you do get an election. You, you make sure you've got a majority and you're getting essentially a runoff for no extra money. Uh, and so <clears throat> that is the, the arguments that they, that they have. So the arguments against the electoral college, 
the reasons are no longer relevant. It never operated as intended. Uh, many people, you can be more informed now when they, they were afraid that people wouldn't be informed as citizens. Changes have been continually made to adjust to our concept of fuller suffrage. Um, those who object to it say uh, we might get a, an, a minority, a person not receiving the majority of votes for president. And far from being unusual, it's happened 15 times in this country that the, that the person went getting the presidency electoral votes did not get the minority. I'm sorry, sorry, did not get a majority. For example, um, Wilson in 1912 and 1916, he had the majority of the vote. He had the plurality of the votes and he had the majority in electoral college, but he did not have a majority of the votes. So he didn't have 50% plus one. Truman didn't in 48, Kennedy in 60, Nixon in 68, and Clinton in neither 92 nor 96. Did he have 50% plus one? He had the plurality, he had the largest number of votes, but not over the 50% mark. The second thing they're concerned about is the risk of the faithless electors. That was dealt with by the 2020 decision that the Supreme Court did in July. Um, the possible role of electoral college in depressing voter turnout. This is the problem. It, it pretty clearly does depress it, the, the voter turnout, which in, increases the significance of the votes in those smaller states, as we said. And in two ways, it does not reflect the national popular will. First, it overrepresents people in rural states because of the two senators that we all get, right? Um, and I've given you some specifics on that. Um, they, one of the data is here in 1988, they said that the combined voting age population of Alaska, Delaware, District of Columbia, North Dakota, South Dakota, Vermont, and Wyoming, which was 3 million plus, uh, had the same voting strength that 9 million people did in Florida. So basically the Floridians vote was one third as significant. And then the other really serious problem is the winner take all mechanism, which was totally adopted by states, not anything they intended, intended to be there, nor is it in the constitution. And that makes it extremely difficult for third party or independent candidates, which is where the, the ranked choice voting that you all have come into is so good because it let, gives people a choice. And so it more accurately reflects the popular will. So in summary, we have, here they are, the arguments in favor and the arguments in opposition, which, you know, I'll, I'll send you this, uh, this, this thing if you want. So I just want to show you some problems we have in the way we depict our elections and think about them. So this is the 2012 election. You look at the electoral map, right? This was, uh, th this was Obama's second election uh, against Mitt Romney. You look at the electoral map and you think, look at my God, look at that. It's all red. You know, this country is like red and the, the, the blues are just clinging to the coast here, a little bit here in the north. But then you look at that same election mapped by population, right? And you look how much blue there is, and you look how much blue there is in states where if it's a red state, that those blue votes do not count. They are completely disregarded. If it's a blue state, all of Eastern Oregon, Eastern Washington, Eastern California, none of those Republican votes matter. In Alaska, a Democratic vote for president hasn't mattered since, God, maybe they voted for Kennedy, I think. That, no, they couldn't vote, they weren't even a state. Yes, they were just a state. That was the first election. Um, so I, I don't know. But um, in Hawaii, a Republican vote is lost. So, these, so this is one of the problems, is that people's votes are completely overlooked and discarded. But you look at that and, and the difference that shows. And the, land, the line I like is land doesn't vote. You know, people do, OK? So here's another example of that. This is this election, 2020. So here's the electoral <coughs> vote. <coughs> and then here's the 2020 votes by county. Now we don't, we don't tally votes by county and a lot of them are reported. So this stuff came from daily costs, basically, uh, the data, but look at that. I mean, and the circle shows how many people there are there, how many votes. And so you see that in terms of population, it's, it's much more balanced, right? Than, than it is by, if you just look at the states themselves. So my question is, are states still an appropriate, an appropriate uh, entity to be making these decisions? So now look at this way of graph in 2020. Here's the electoral vote up above. Here it is voted by vote share. And you can see sort of, you know, that strongly blue, slightly blue, slightly red, strongly red. And I love the one on the bottom. These are the votes as it is, the popular vote. That's what the country would look like. There's a name for this kind of weird graph, but isn't that interesting? If, if, there were, if every vote counted equally, um, that's what it would look like.
So here's the question. So what, what is the problem? The problem is that there are a whole bunch of flyover states, not just the ones they think of. These are the votes that are ignored by campaigns and where minority anybody who votes for the wrong party is completely ignored. It is a total violation of one person, one vote. And so here you see, um, here you see the flyover states. You know, not, none of the rural states are battleground states. Let's just keep flying. Those are the real flyover states. Now, Maine, of course, in this last election, late Maine has become a swing state because of, of, of the um, dividing of your votes. So what are those states? Now, I put this map together in or this, these charts together in October. So we didn't know how the election was going to turn out. This was based on the data in October. All right. So Democratic safe states. These are states in all. I mean, this part's accurate. It's just the red things that are slightly different. Democratic states in all five elections since 2000. All right. 15 states, 192 electoral college votes. So you look at these states. They voted five straight elections Democrat. Minnesota also had done that, but people thought in this election they might be up for grabs. That's why it's red. But so understand that no campaign events happened here. No money was spent. Those of us in Oregon are glad because it means you don't have to watch those campaign ads all the time, which some of you guys definitely had to watch, right? But, but other than that, your, your interests aren't there, your issues aren't there, and nobody's paying attention. Here are the Republican, safe Republican seats, uh, states in those last five elections. And here there, you have some uh, tw 22 states, 179 votes. So here you see the states that were seen to be in October as potential battleground states, even though they had been uh, Republican for five elections, Arizona, Georgia, and Texas. And they were right about that in October, right? As it turned out. So here are the potential swing states in all five elections, 14 states that have vacillated back and forth. 166 electoral college votes. And the ones with bold are the ones people really saw as the battlegrounds this year. And they were right, right? Florida, Michigan, uh, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. So what have we got here basically? It's all about the swing states, right? I'd like to buy a red, which is essentially what you're looking at. And here you've got campaign visits, right? These are all the states, eight states with 24 electoral votes had one campaign visit. 10, Wisconsin had 40 campaign visits. 10, well, 10 electoral votes. 96% of campaign events in 2020 happened in these states. And that's how many events. So how anybody can say the electoral college means campaigning all over the country, that is just simply not true. And that's, that's not their electoral vote. That's how many campaign events they had right? 21 in Michigan, right? Isn't that Michigan? I'm not really good at my maps. I'm in shapes. 21, I think. You know, 25. Look at Pennsylvania. Um, seven in, um, that's Georgia, right? 31 in Florida. 31. So this is, this is like two cartoons that show you the overemphasis on Pennsylvania. <laughs> I like this one. Pennsylvania is the whole country. Uh, welcome to Pennsylvania, the bane of our elections. Um, so what's the history of swing states? They first started talking about swing states in 1936 when Roosevelt ran against Alf Landon. Each one thought they won a state because they swang, they swung through the state. Uh, it's, it's sort of been calling them um, battleground states now. But basically there have been states that have swapped back and forth since the Civil War, basically. But um, so when Roosevelt was campaigning in the West, it didn't pick up steam until 2000 when people really started calling govern, uh, battleground states. But they're not always consistent. People change, states change their population, they change their personality, more moderate voters, fewer moderate voters. So Iowa and Ohio were uber competitive states uh, earlier than they became blowouts. California used to be a swing state. Maine and Michigan weren't, weren't that competitive in 08 or 12, but lurched to the right in 2016. And here we have 1948. I love that picture, right? The history of America, several examples of swing states determining the victory, right? In 48, Truman defeated Dewey by winning a margin of less than 1% of the popular vote in the then swing states of Ohio, California, Indiana, Illinois, and New York. And then, of course, Bush and Al Gore came down to Florida. And in 2016, uh, Trump's came down to a very small fraction of votes. So that, that is what has happened. I, I like to tease uh, our parent, Mark's and my mother, and Janice is here, because uh, because. They voted Republican after after they grew up, after they I'd vote, I guess they voted for FDR probably their first election. But then they voted Republican straight along until they forgot to vote, she told me, in 1948. They went on a little trip 
and they forgot to vote. They went to Canada. And I said, well, see, that headline is because of you, mom. Right there, those two votes that you did not vote uh, for uh, Dewey, that's what happened right there. They did, by the way, vote one time not for Republican. They voted for Perot. So um, as you can see, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, or possibly it does. At any rate, uh, what's next, basically? So should we eliminate it, or should we reform it? So there are three basic ways that people are talking about changing it if you think it needs to be changed. One is by the constitutional amendment uh, for a national popular vote. It, that takes two thirds vote in both houses of Congress and ratification by 38 states. In this current environment, it's I think very unlikely it would be extremely difficult. It is the cleanest way and almost happened back in 72, like we said. The second uh, sort of most popular notion is something called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. It started in 2007 and it's still in place. And it is an agreement among state legislatures to get together and decide how to allocate their electoral votes, which as we know, they absolutely can by the constitution, right? And so instead they decided long ago to allocate them statewide by winner take all, except for New York, for Nebraska and Maine. They can do the same thing now by saying we are going to allocate our electoral votes by the national popular vote winner. So had had um, you know or had this happened with Oregon, Oregon voted for Clinton in, in 2016, but had this been in place, Oregon's electoral votes would have gone to Trump because he, I'm sorry, vice versa. Sorry, 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 let me reverse that. If you were in a state that voted for Trump in, in 2016, Clinton would have gotten your state's votes because the legislature, if they were a compact state. And the compact states here are Maryland, New Jersey, Illinois, Hawaii, Washington, Massachusetts, DC, Vermont, California, Rhode Island, New York, Connecticut, Colorado, Delaware, New Mexico, and Oregon. And you will see that they are all states that are right now are being run by Democrats. And that is because, you know, the Republicans feel like the Electoral College is the ox being gored, I think, is because they feel like it benefits them. But the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact is a bipartisan group, and they have some pretty heavy hitter Republicans on this group, including Michael Steele, who used to be the national chair of the Republican Party. So there are some far seeing, in my view, Republicans that are supporting this. So it's, it's an asterisk on Colorado because uh, there was an initiative put on their ballot in 2020 to repeal their approval of the compact, but the people of Colorado voted again to stay in the compact. So the one, the two problems with this way, it doesn't go into effect until there are 270 electoral votes in the compact. Right now, there are only, um, not only, but there are 196. So the states add up to 196. This compact doesn't go into effect until they've got enough states to make 270, right? Because it has to be enough to be the majority in electoral college. So obviously one of the weaknesses is a state legislature can change. It changes its population and changes its mind. That can happen. Another argument some people say they're opposed to this is that the constitution prohibits interstate compacts or it very much limits the compact states can do. But there's a lot of evidence that, that the judicial, judici that's not the right one, but the legal history of this country with the Supreme Court is that they've approved many types of interstate compacts. So of course, if this went into effect, it would be litigated immediately, would go to the Supreme Court. But the question, and that would depend who's sitting on the Supreme Court, right? But, but they do feel like they have a lot of precedence. And if you're at all interested in this, here's a small text that is called Every Vote Equal. It's published by the Interstate Compact and it's only $5 on Amazon. If you want, it says every fact you would ever want to know about the Electoral College or about the arguments in support of the Interstate Compact, okay? So another option that some people think is less drastic than the Interstate, the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, which by the way, is not an undermining of the Electoral College. Absolutely not. It is firmly, firmly rooted in the Constitution of the United States because states have the authority to determine how their electoral votes are allocated, period. So proportional allocation by congressional districts. This is what Madison and Jefferson and the framers thought was gonna happen, remember? And this is what you do in Maine and Nebraska. So people are saying, well, maybe we could all do that. And the question people have asked is how would that have changed the last election? And you look at it here. This is a, a schema that shows what would have happened if everybody used Maine and Nebraska's plan which is that two senatorial votes are allocated to the statewide 
and the others are done by congressional district. So you can see that Biden would have won with 277, but it was much closer. Trump would have had 261. And you, but you also see that there are votes of the opposite party reflected. So it is clearly closer to the will of the people in that state, right? Then winner take all is. Although it still is disproportionate. It still means, uh, the one by the way, I just want you to know in Oregon would have been my congressional district. We are represented by the one Republican in our delegation. Um, it's all Eastern Oregon and little Ashland bubble, uh, <clears throat> who's kind of like a mini Eugene. Um, so the question is, is that is one issue. It's still not really proportional. And the other problem with doing it by congressional district in a state that is at all larger than Maine is this, the gerrymander. And the problem is state legislatures control the drawing of the lines for di congressional districts. And we already have some outrageous districts in many states. And both parties have done this when they're in control. And that's why House Resolution 1, which is in front of uh, the Senate right now, calls for in every state having a, a nonpartisan commission to determine their boundary lines. And that is a crucial thing that some states have adopted. But the gerrymander, of course, this comes back to 1813 because the governor, Eldridge Gary, was part of this drawing this particular uh, district for a state uh, house seat or Senate seat. And it looked like a, a, a salamander is what they thought. So that's how they, they managed to do that. So the gerrymandering would be a huge weakness, I think, uh, in this problem, if, but unless we could get it into the hands of nonpartisans, uh, which might make it more equitable. So it would might be an interim solution or who knows, basically. So anyway, I began with the preamble to the constitution uh, because we the people, because I think it's such a glorious and wonderful aspirational statement. I'd like to end with Benjamin Franklin's remarks, closing remarks to the Constitutional Convention. And as you probably know, Benjamin Franklin died shortly after the Constitutional Convention. Uh, he is an extraordinary man as well, who was participant in all of the major events of our early, our colonial plus, you know, that, that whole 40 or 50 years. Uh, every document has his signature on it. And he was, he was so ill by this time, actually, that he, someone else had to read this speech to him. And I'm not gonna read it all to you, but I will send it to you because I think it is a, a wonderful thing that we should all remember, but particularly some of these points. He says at the beginning, this was the day they voted, September 17th, uh, 1787. He, his statement was, I confess that there are several parts of this constitution which I do not at present approve, but I am not sure that I shall never approve them. For having lived long, I've experienced many instances of being obliged by better information or fuller consideration to change opinions, even on important subjects, which I once thought right, but found to be otherwise. It is therefore that the older I grow, the more apt I am to doubt my own judgment and to pay more respect to the judgment of others. He says, most men indeed, as well as most sects and religion think themselves in possession of all truth and that wherever others differ from them, it is so far error. Um, he, I like his name, of course, typical Franklin. Few express it so naturally as a certain French lady who in a dispute with her sister said, I don't know how it happens, sister, but I meet with nobody but myself that's always in the right. <laughs> and he says, in these sentiments, sir, I agree to this constitution with all its faults if they are such, because I think a general government necessary for us, and there is no form of government but what may be a blessing to the people if well administered. And I believe that further that this is likely to be well administered for a course of years and can only end in despotism as other forms have done before it, when the people shall become so corrupted as to need despotic government being incapable of any other. But I certainly hope that that is not true. He is saying uh, that we are at that point. It astonishes me, sir, to find this system approaching so near to perfection as it does. And I think it will astonish our enemies who are waiting with confidence to hear that our councils are confounded like those of the builders of Babel and that our states are on the point of separation, only to meet hereafter for the purpose of cutting one another's throats. Thus I consent, sir, to this constitution because I expect no better and because I'm not sure that it's not the best. The opinions I've had of its errors, I sacrifice to the public good. So I hope therefore that for our own sakes as a part of the people and for the sake of posterity, we shall act heartily and unanimously in recommending this constitution wherever our influence may extend and turn our future thoughts and endeavors to the means of having it well administered. On the whole, sir, I cannot help expressing a wish that every member of the convention who may still have objections to it would with me on this occasion, doubt a little of his own infallibility and to make manifest our unanimity, put his name to this instrument. 
And man, I wish that that would be a speech we would hear on the floor of the US Senate. I'm still perplexed about what happens if you have the popular vote, national popular vote, with all of those states in the middle where the, the population is so small. And, and I guess my, my thought is that there is something that is in some ways protected by the Electoral College, which is the cultural um, un, uh, unity of, of certain regions of the country or certain states. And, and I think that's what may be keeping people protecting that. Is this, this, is this a federal system in which the state unit deserves to continue to exist and to define the voters of that particular place? Even though within it, as you said, there are people voting the different way in every one of those states and their vote is completely ignored. I don't know if you know the book, um, The 11 Rival Nations of North America. Do you know that book by Colin Woodard? He lives in Portland and he writes for the Portland Press Herald. Mm. He, this is an amazing book. Look at this map. This is the map. He's talking about nations as in culturally nations. But you look here, he demonstrates to me conclusively, and maybe Marsha wants to chime in on this, that these are the cultural areas. They're not states boundaries. It explains why, for example, in Pennsylvania, there are three different sections. Look, it, it's like the left coast. This is why the, the western part, the eastern part of all of our states are part of the far west. They don't share the values and the culture. Yankeedom has distinct values and distinct mm -hmm. cultural things. And it's not just in New England. Right, right. And so this is these votes, this tracks, this guy wrote this in 2011. This tracks with the elections since 2016, 2012, 2016, and 2020. And the way he, he describes where these people came from, like Appalachia was settled by Southern Scots and Northern oh, yeah. Irish, who were these yeah. like rugged, I'm going to take care of myself, you know, don't mess with me people in their own country. And they brought that there to Appalachia. You know, it's just, uh, it's a fascinating book. It, it, it really, it really explains. It, it's one of those books where you read it and think, well, I could have known that but I didn't <laughs> and it all falls into place you know it's like a like oh 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 I think those are the kind of feelings people have when they read it yeah now I mean there's some of the statements he makes you might not totally buy and, and there's certain things to argue with but on the whole it's a terrific book for a, just readjusting your focus a little bit uh on mm -hmm. things things fall mm -hmm. into place so I urge you I urge you guys to read it are states still relevant or are they actually obsolete and that mm -hmm. is your question because if you look at the boundaries of states seriously especially the 13 original states, those are colonies that a guy in, Lo in London, a man in London who didn't own this land, gave it to other people who didn't own it, and they drew little lines completely based on nothing, except you get this part and you get that. And they have no, sometimes they have a barrier like a river or a mountain, but they don't have any particular anything that made them a state, except mm -hmm. they were a colony and then they became a state. Right. Right. I would just argue, uh, and and we. Can, I'd love to talk with you about this uh, this summer. We're going to uh, do. But this. but I would just argue that if you look at Piscataquis County as an example, mm -hmm. the the cultural identity is part of the problem right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know the and I say the problem. It's it's a, a schism that we are experiencing in our region, and it's because of cultural identity. And I think that's true all over the country. When I taught the class about this book, I said, I have three, three purposes. One of them is I want you to be introduced to this book because I think it's a really important book. And secondly, I think it will help us understand things that have not made sense to some of us about why people are splitting their votes the way they do. But thirdly, it'll help us have conversations across those lines because right. we'll understand more about where people are coming from. And we might be and then able to have the conversation. Wait, I just remembered this. This is going to, I'm going to use this in my next class. And I just have <laughs> this on my thing. I know you want to see this too, because this is right up the alley of what we're just talking about. This is something I just saw two weeks ago. Support for secession from the United States. And they did a poll after the election. 